In this video, we're going to take a look at the differences between a hobby grade scan and a professional one. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video, I'm going to focus specifically on the geometry of a hobby based scan mesh body and a professional one. Now the hobby one was sent by one of our subscribers and I'm not going to name him uh, because I don't want anybody hounding him for doing scans, but I do appreciate getting this scan here and the topic is reverse engineering off of scan data. Now we've done a lot on the channel for reverse engineering or designing parts off of scan data, but it's important to understand that there are different levels of scan data and they're not all created equal. So we're going to be taking a look at this, which was done with a hobby grade scanner, something that's in the $1,000 and under range. And then we'll take a look at a professional one. So the first thing that I want to identify is the mesh itself. We can see that there's a lot of bumps here. And if I bring back the edges, you'll also notice that there's these sort of rings in the mesh. Now these happen when we're using scanners or at least hobby grade scanners, and the mesh is not retopologized. So Often there is a misconception that when you scan something, you want to bring the mesh in exactly as you have it. But professional mesh manipulation software will be able to remesh that and remove these sorts of issues while maintaining accuracy to the original. So when we take a look at the professional scan, we'll take a look at that as well. One of the second sort of myths is that more mesh elements, more facets or faces or vertices are going to re recreate the object better. And that's not really true. And this is why professional mesh manipulation software and professionals who do this, they will create a very high density scan and then they will remesh that using mesh software to accurately represent the object with as few number of facets as possible. This gives you the lightest weight possible file to mess around with, but it does allow you to replicate the geometry. And the third thing that I want to talk about is accuracy. Now, this cover here is for a motorcycle. It's a clutch cover protector, so it has a lot of rounded corners already. But we wouldn't be able to accurately figure out where all of the, the mounting points are based on the scan. Now, just looking at this, I would assume that there were some button head screws that were left in the holes. And oftentimes this might seem like a good way to sort of seal the holes, but it actually makes it a little bit more difficult to get good information off of this. And you can also see that this small section here, that's obviously not large enough for the head of a screw. And a lot of times what happens with hobby grade or lower end scanners, is that the shadows really are problematic. So you end up getting these areas where things just sort of blob or roll together because it's doing its best to try to figure out what those corners are. Now, there's a lot that you can do in terms of prepping your parts and setting up the lighting and the scene and helping the scan get the best possible result. But ultimately, there are just lower and higher resolution scans. So the next thing that I want to do is I want to take a look at a high resolution or a high quality scan. Now, this scan was provided to me by a friend of mine, Paul at Moto Salino. Now, Moto Salino is a business in Atlanta, Georgia, and Paul has invested heavily in reverse engineering and scanning technology. He has a high-end scanner and the software that's needed to create parts like this. Now, as we're looking at this, you might think, well, this, this kind of looks like a final part, but this is actually the mesh. Now, this mesh has fewer facets or fewer faces than the lower quality or hobby grade scan mesh does. However, this is much more accurate. Now, part of that comes down to the scanner itself. Part of it is due to prep and how you scan the object. And another part of that has to do with the software used to manipulate and orient the mesh. So Paul is really good at what he does and he took some time, this is actually a fairly old scan, but he took some time to make sure that the scan, the original mesh that came in or the point cloud was accurate when it was remeshed and mesh manipulation software is able to do that. Another thing that we'll notice is that this has a ton of detail on it. As we rotate it around, we can see information such as the manufacture date, the recycle, information about the bearing location for the clutch, 
And even if we rotate this thing around the outside, we can see some threads inside of the oil fill hole. Now, some of this stuff, obviously, there, there is a limit to what a line of sight scanner will be able to do. And obviously, getting inside the, the threads here is not something that it can do. But um, the detail or the level of detail on this is pretty amazing. So the next thing that's extremely important that we should think about when we talk about professional versus hobby level scanning and just the mesh in general is its alignment to a coordinate system. And this is something that's often overlooked. Now, this part that Paul sent me has perfect alignment with the coordinate system. I didn't do any orientation when I brought it in. I just sort of brought the file in. So from the front view, everything looks great. And as we rotate this around, you'll notice that the mounting face of this is not at all in line with any of the coordinate system. And this is just the nature on how this part is designed and manufactured in the case on the R6. But that aside, you know, the design itself is aligned to our standard planes, which means that as we reverse engineer, we can use our front, our side, and our top planes. If we take a look at the hobby scan, if I take a look at this from the front, this is the orientation in which it was placed in the scanner. So the coordinate system reference relative to the scanner has not been adjusted at all. And that is typically a problem with a software side of things in working with the mesh data, but it can be extremely problematic when you get to the design side because then you no longer have symmetry about your origin. The orientation is just not really relative to anything. So you can see here, the orientation of our X, Y, and Z relative to our part. So with all those points out of the way, it's important that we understand that even with a high quality scanner, there will still be limitations to what Fusion can do. We're not gonna go through reverse engineering this part because honestly, it's a lot of effort and I don't think it's really worth it. I don't think it's a realistic workflow for somebody to use Fusion 360 as the only source of recreating mesh data. But if you are working in Fusion 360 and you want to do this type of work, let's take a look at how we would do it. Now I have covered this in a previous video, but we're gonna go through a couple of steps quickly here just so that we can understand what we can get out of scan data that's high quality like this and where we still might fall a little short. So first I need to go into direct editing mode, select the mesh body and say, okay. Note that you could also turn off capture design history without going into direct editing mode. So the two things that we're going to do, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna recreate or create part of this oil fill hole. And then we're gonna create another plane to work on the back or the mounting flange. So in Fusion 360, the way that I do this is I place a plane through three points. Now this is a great high quality scan and I'm just gonna pick three random points around the outside of this to generate a plane. I'm gonna repeat that same process, making a plane for the mounting face. So construct three points, and we're gonna come back here. So once again, I'm just gonna pick three random points to make sure that I generate a plane, and I wanna make sure that I stay in the middle of that face. So now that I have those, I'm gonna hop out of direct editing, and first we're gonna take a look at the oil fill. So in order to do this in Fusion, we need to create a mesh section sketch. We select the mesh body, we select the plane, and you'll notice that instantly we have a lot of noise. And even with a mesh that has relatively close tolerances with the original part, we still have to deal with these highs and lows. So the best way that I found to do this is to offset our sketch plane just a small amount. In this case, I'll go 0.1 millimeters and it instantly cleans everything up. Now, if you're trying to accurately recreate a part like this, you need to account for that 0.1 millimeters if it is going to affect your design. Now, we're also gonna do the same thing on the back, and then we'll take a look at what those sketches actually give us. So select your mesh body, select the plane, and once again, I'm gonna offset this minus 0.1 just to clean it up a little bit. So once I have those two, I'm gonna hide the mesh body and I'm gonna focus on just the sketches. Now, again, I, I wanna note that this mesh has been remeshed and cleaned up quite a bit. And the original mesh body, you know, would have been, uh, there would have been a little bit more noise to it, but these are still very accurate. Now, as we look at these two designs, I'm gonna to go to sketch one, I'm gonna edit, and we're going to use what's called fit curves to mesh section. 
Now there are a couple options in here for curve types. The best one for this is going to be circle. And all we do is we simply select the mesh and take a look at the max curve deviation, 0.15 or 149 millimeters, 0.15 millimeters. Now that deviation seems pretty small. And as we take a look, you can see that our mesh has a lot of noise to it. So even with a high quality scanner, even if you're spending 50 or $100,000 on scanning equipment, you are still not going to get a true arc or a true circle or a true spline. You are gonna get a lot of highs and lows, a lot of noise. And again, that's just a product of the way that these scanners work. So you need to make sure that you do dimension these. And if you know exactly, if you know exactly what the dimension is going to be, sorry, 27.5, then you can use that to your advantage. So from here, what we would do is we would turn that into an actual feature, just like you would do with anything. Now, again, keep in mind the performance in Fusion is going to be dependent upon partially your computer, but a lot of it comes down to the, the mesh that you're working with. So this one, I'm gonna go down a distance of, let's see, Eh, that looks like it's about right. And then in the other direction, so since we have two sides, I'm going to go 0.1. That was how much I offset that originally. So again, we're starting to recreate that feature. You can see that we've got a feature in its place. Next, let's take a look at the second sketch so we can drive home one last point here. Now, once again, we could use the tools to place a circle at the center of these holes, but we've already seen that. And what I really want to highlight is even with an extremely precise, high quality sketch, we can't just come in here and say, create a closed spline and select part of the mesh and expect it to be perfect. Now, if you look at the max curve deviation, it's a relatively small number. This is gonna be 0 0.01 millimeters, but that's not the entire story. And here is where you can get into trouble. If we take a look at the spline that was created and we turn on curvature combs, that is not a smooth spline. That is not what we would hope to see. Now, in reality, if I were to create a spline, even if I used a bunch of spline points like this, and we click on it and we look at a curvature comb, that is what a smooth curve looks like. That's what we would expect to see. And I can guarantee you that the Yamaha engineers did not create a case or an engine cover like this. So what does that mean for us in terms of designing a part? Well, at the end of the day, there are a lot of different design decisions that have to be made as you begin reverse engineering parts. You need to understand first the quality of the part that you scanned. Are we dealing with a part that was immaculate, that was absolutely perfect, no imperfections, perfectly prepped and ready to scan? Or was there a potential damage to the part that we're going to have to rebuild and remodel? The second thing is going to be understanding how far off the scan actually is from the real part. Now, in this case, this real part is cast aluminum with some machined features. Now, when it, whenever you have a cast part, it obviously is going to have draft on it. So we have to think about that when we're trying to recreate this part. And also keep in mind that there are areas that are machined. So we're likely going to have a fairly sharp or a tight corner, and we can see on the mesh, even when we zoom in here, on this high quality mesh, we still have a lot of variation. So we're going to have to take a lot of these things into consideration as we try to recreate our parts because the scan is only going to be a reference. It's not gonna be perfect. There are going to be variances that happen throughout the mesh, just based on the process, based on this line of sight type of scanning. So that's kind of a dirty little secret is that these scanners, even the extremely high-end scanners, are still going to have these same problems. They might be a bit more subdued or they might be you know, less of a concern, but they will still be there. So what does that mean for you? Well, as you've seen on this channel, we have recreated parts off of scans. We did a complete fender recreation for a Fiat race car. We've looked at building overbodies and wide body fenders. And those are all from different types of mesh bodies, either hobby scans or professional scans in the case of the Tesla spoiler and the wide body, or in some cases like the Mercedes, it was a modeled car that was converted to a mesh or that was a mesh conversion. It wasn't a scan, it was, a, it was something that was modeled. So those are all 
examples of big parts. And big parts, the tolerances are less of a concern. But when you get down to trying to recreate a mechanical part, you really need to think about if you have the part, what kind of condition it is, can you measure it, what is the end result? What are you looking to get out of it after the fact? Are you trying to recreate that part exactly, or do you just need the bolt holes for references, the locations of any locating dowel pins, the clutch mechanism, and so on? Now, if, if it's just close enough is okay for you, then yeah, sure, you can make use of scan data and just use it as a reference. But it's important that we don't expect to pay $500 for a hobby grade scanner and think that we're just gonna be able to scan and reproduce anything that's available to us. Now, I do wanna make one last note. Again, I wanna thank the subscriber for sending me this clutch cover and also thank Paul for sending me this, um, this high resolution scan of a clutch cover. Again, if you're looking to have your parts scanned, then I'll put a link in the description to Moto Salino. You guys can reach out to Paul and he'll be able to tell you how much your parts will cost. You can ship them to him, he can scan them, create the mesh and, and all that stuff. So uh, keep in mind that that is available if you don't wanna go out and purchase your own scanner, you don't wanna spend you know, a ton of money. Now the last little piece of this puzzle that I didn't really get into and I plan to get into in another video is the software. Now Fusion is a great piece of software. Obviously I support it here on this channel, but scan data is very specific. And Fusion 360 can work with it, but it's really not the intent of the program. So what does that leave you with if you're trying to do this at a professional level? Well, it leaves you with a big bill to be able to get into this area because tools like Geometric Design X and Design X Essentials range from 10 to $20,000. And I believe that is a yearly fee. I'd have to dig into that a little bit more, but that is orders of magnitude larger than we have with Fusion at three to $400. So for me, understanding that the tools that are available or the tools that are on the market to do this type of work cost that much money, I am by no means upset with what Fusion is able to do. But it's important that we just set our expectations at what we can do with the tools we have. So at this point, if you guys want to see more on this topic, if you want me to try to convince Paul to get into Geomagic and we can kind of go into the software and talk about what it can do, then please let me know. Leave a comment below and, and we'll try to get another video going on actually working with the scan data and how that differs from working with it in Fusion. If you have any general questions, please let me know. And as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.